So I have obviously the, the most common question, which is um, what led you to Southeast Asian studies and Burmese uh, at SARS? Mm. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I initially uh, signed up to do Arabic and Hebrew uh, because I'm half Israeli and then took a gap year and during that gap year went to Southeast Asia and felt so drawn to the feeling, the culture, the people. Um, so I went to Bhutan, Vietnam, Thailand, um, and then Myanmar. And Myanmar just stuck more than any of the other places. So that was me, uh, the beginning of a fascination with Southeast Asia. But then specifically my answer to why I started learning Burmese is the, the justification is in, is in learning it in and of itself. There is, it's such a beautiful language. It's fascinating, the, the writing, the hearing it. There's something, there's something so beautiful about, um, especially for me hearing people from Mandalay speak Burmese. So that's, that's my answer to that. Um, and uh, I encourage everyone to learn it. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I like how you, um, you speak so highly about the language and you're definitely, it's definitely um, uh, a, a love relationship. Mm. I, I'm, I'm a linguist, I'm not a linguist, but I, I love learning languages. It's kind of in my nature. My mother tongue is Dutch and then um, I learned English as a teenager and, and then French. Um, so I do like languages, but, so, but Burmese is so radically different from the ones I'd learned before. Um, speaking a little bit of Hebrew as well. It, it's just so different and beautiful. And there's, there's really no reason not to promote it, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely, I completely agree with you. And, um, and, your, and so your experience at SARS, you were there for three years? Is Correct. That, yeah, and so, and so how was that experience coming from, you know, taking a gap year and, and, and going abroad and then coming back to, to London where it's um, you know, very cosmopolitan, but at the same time, you're, you're in a city, you're in a stable environment. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So that trip in Southeast, around Southeast Asia was, was yeah, it was mind blowing. It really was, it was, it was almost life changing. And then um, that was the beginning of the gap year. So I had time to settle down in France and learn French. So that was, it was kind of France, going to Paris was a transition before I went to SOAS. So it wasn't too much of a shock. Um, and the way I saw it is, okay, so I've, I've seen Southeast Asia now. And when I started at SOAS, all the, the beginning of the uh, classes were all like history of, of the different countries in the region. And it, it felt like I could just remember where I had been and I could, I could associate with things. So it was quite a special experience because A, the, the classes were so small and B, I had had that, I had that association. So it wasn't that um, weird or difficult. And then in terms of living in London, I mean, London is huge and you're right. It's, um, you have to find your place, but it was really easy. Like I lived in Dinwiddie and I don't know, there was something, there's something about SOAS people that I can't quite explain, but it was, it was instant. <laughs> and I met some incredible people there, people that I will have with me for the rest of my life, my best friends. So it was very easy to assimilate, uh, even though they all did different um, degrees and study different things. It's kind of like SOAS is like, you know, the SOAS tribe. I always find that whenever I, you know, set foot in SOAS, or if I'm ever going to um, the SU bar, or even Dinwiddie, I always, I always just get along with the people. There's this, there's this kind of mutual relationship where everyone is just respecting one another, and um, there's some kind of coherence which brings us all into this tribe. I, that, that that's how I explain it, really. Yeah, and it doesn't matter how radically like what the different things are that people are doing or how different their life stories are or where they're from. Uh, there is definitely a mutual, uh, there's a commonality. I mean, yesterday I met a, some a very, like a top uh, like representative from the IMF here. And um, after kind of an hour of chatting, 
he mentioned that he also went to SOAS wow. and that he was the ambassador of SOAS in Mongolia. And it was just so cool to meet in Myanmar. And uh, it just immediately just, um, we were so connected instantly because of the SOAS connection, talking about the SU bar when he was there, or when I was there, and <laughs> yeah, it was great. Oh, that's nice. Did, did, anything, did anything change? Was, was there anything which, you know, you, you spoke about and he was like, oh, well, you know, we never had that or, um, yeah, something like that. Uh, not really. Actually, that was the great thing to hear. Everything he said was what I would have said. He was like, oh, yeah, the SU bar and oh, the vibe in general, going to the park. And I, th I think, I don't know if he mentioned Hare Krishna, but, you know, like, it was basically the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well, that's nice. And... Um, yeah. And I, I'm very interested in this in in this question that I'm going to ask because learning languages mm -hmm. is very easy for some people, very difficult for other people. And in terms of the specific course at SOAS and learning Burmese, was it something which um, your development in in that in that um, language was it was it easier in, initially, or were, were there some struggles? What was it like? Very good question. The, the reason I think it ultimately worked out was because I had one ling linguistic professor who knew 13 Latin, knows 13 languages and is very good at seeing the technical side of things. And then I also had a native speaker teaching me. And so having those two combined, and then on top of that, having the SOAS Myanmar Society, which I was chairing at the time, and we had quite a big group of people. We had about 55 people, something like that, which was quite big, wow. um, with a lot of Burmese people. That combination was very powerful. Having said that though, Burmese is a language where you have to be in the country. So uh, after three years, even though I'd been studying for Burmese for um, like lessons for three hours a week, because it's only part of the degree, um, when I arrived here, I couldn't really speak. I could say like, and that was it. <laughs> but it gave me a foundation and I can sense now that in the way that I'm learning is so much easier than people who come here and, um, and study from scratch. Uh, as in, so as gives you that solid foundation. And that's what I think is so, so good about the course. And then of course, John O'Kell's uh, legacy is in, in the way they teach. Burmese by ear and, and I was very fortunate to be taught by John as well because Justin was on leave and that was a, also an amazing experience. And was there was there anything which um, you know was your was there anything which you, you found uh, was your strength? So for example for me I, I, I do find that my writing I, I really enjoy writing it and I really enjoy um, the spelling and the, the whole structure. So I think for me, my strength is probably the writing aspect, and my listening is is a bit is a bit shaky. Was that the same <laughs> with you uh, when you were um, studying, or, um, or 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 was it something different? Uh, listening was my strength, <laughs> I think. Oh, okay. My writing was terrible. Um, my understanding of grammar was terrible, but. Um, my, I think my core strength, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. My core strength was being able to read, even though I didn't understand anything. So I could read as if I knew what I was saying. <laughs> my it's accent was good. confidence, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, <laughs> so I would just read it and then Justin would be like, wow, Maya, great. So what does it say? And then just silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you can read it, then that's okay. That you know, that's that's half of it already, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so so you um, so you did your you did your degree at SARS three years, and then it was um, two thousand and nineteen when you graduated. Is that right? Correct. And then you you're now in Myanmar. What is what is living in Myanmar like, and what about this pandemic? You know, what is what's going on? 
uh, yeah, so what is living in Myanmar like? It's, um, it's nothing that I could have expected. Uh, every day is a, a beautiful bundle of chaos. Uh, <laughs> there are power cuts and this and that, um, but it's also a bustling, like I live in Yangon, it's a hustling, bustling city, even during COVID, I'll speak about COVID in a minute. Um, but the thing that's so beautiful about living in Yangon is that the people are, especially to foreigners, incredibly kind and helpful and generous. Um, there's a reason that Myanmar is, is one of the most um, generous countries in terms of giving donations to each other. And you really feel that. So whenever I've had a problem, whenever I've been, for example, on my bike and suddenly the, the, I have a puncture, someone immediately, like five people immediately come and help or um, when I don't have enough change for something, people will chip in. Or when I've forgotten my wallet in a taxi, they'll come and bring it back. These kind of things are amazing. So um, living in Yangon during the pandemic has been a massive uh, blessing because uh, the sense of community is very strong. Uh, even though we can't see each other and, and things, regulations have been quite strict. Um, everyone is super connected on Facebook because Facebook is like the Google of Myanmar. Everyone's on Facebook. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's, it's been great because there has been that sense of solidarity and um, among Myanmar people as well as foreigners. Um, and uh, there were the elections as well. So before the elections, things were very closed and, and it, you know, there, was, there were curfews and um, you could be arrested if you weren't wearing a mask and stuff like that. Now that the elections have happened, things are looking to open slowly. Um, still, we're not able to take international flights or domestic flights, but uh, hopefully domestic flights will continue in about uh, two weeks or one week or two weeks time, yeah. And um, yeah, but international flights haven't been going since about March. So that's been crazy, you know, not being able to go home. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but, but there is a hope, right? There is, you can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel? Yes. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Well, that I guess that's that's um, quite important. Um, <laughs> and then, what about the transition from moving to from London to Myanmar, um, and then find and then trying to find work there? Right? Was it was it something which was quite scary mm -hmm. at first? And how do you reflect on that? The transition was definitely scary. Um, six months before I went, I started uh, applying to lots of jobs. I think about 80 jobs in total uh, via email. I would send my CV and I would say who I am uh, because I, even though everyone told me, oh, you'll find something when you're there, I was still quite nervous. Um, and what ended up happening was I got rejected by about 90% of the people I applied with, uh, most of the people not replying. But then I was extremely fortunate. I actually sent a message to an email to the a company or not company, an organization that I could only dream of working for and really just didn't expect it. I had applied to the UN and got rejected. So I was like, you know what, this dream one, I'll never get. But then the, the boss said, I mean, I said in my, you know, in my email, I said, I'm about to graduate with a degree in Burmese and Southeast Asian studies. And the moment she heard that I could speak Burmese, she was interested, even though I didn't have much on my CV. And so she was like, okay, well, I'm actually in London right now. Let's have a coffee. And it, ended, it, it turned out that she wanted to give, it, give me a, a shot. So when I arrived here, I immediately became intern. And then after being intern for a couple of weeks was um, promoted to being a consultant. And then after a couple of weeks being consultant was promoted to being a permanent associate. So it was really like incredible. I was able to have that opportunity only because I spoke Burmese. And I wasn't, to be fair, I wasn't really using it. Everything is in English. It's an NGO that promotes responsible business conduct, but the importance um, from the organization's point of view and for everyone I meet, um, it's vital. It shows a sign of respect. It shows a sign of, uh, I am equal to you. And um, it allowed me to forge complex relationships much faster. Yeah, I think this idea of respect is such an important thing, right? Because um, where, where, wherever you're going, I think language is, 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 an, is a beautiful technology which we have been gifted. And 
um, by learning another language, you are, you know, mutually just respecting the other person, you know, acknowledging um, someone else's language and um, showing that you're willing to um, make yourself vulnerable in order to um, share a common language, which isn't necessarily English, which is usually the standard uh, mode. Correct. I like how you say it. I fully agree with you. Yeah. And um, okay, so 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 the, this organization that you're talking about right now, you worked with them to um, uh, produce the the first uh, LGBT and equality in the workplace uh, handbook, right? Correct. And um, what was this? What was this project? You know, um, about what was your experience with this? And also, how was this? A handbook received by businesses in Myanmar. Oh, I love this question. I'm going to get. I'm getting excited now. Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, the month that I arrived, we had a workshop that brought together um, big multinationals and uh, SMEs um, to learn more about LGBT plus in the workplace. At this time, I had just arrived, and the moment the workshop ended, the first thing I said was. Why don't we phrase the term LGBT plus? And second of all, why don't we create a handbook? Because there hasn't been one. So my boss uh, immediately agreed and we forged a partnership with the biggest LGBT plus organization in Myanmar. Um, and we wanted to create something that would be a direct kind of manual. Like, here you go. It's very short, it's very simple. It's got lots of cartoons. Um, it's almost trying to make it a, a pleasurable experience to read. And the reason that the creating the handbook was uh, lied so closely to my heart is because A, I'm queer, so it's, it's, a very, it's a, something I'm very passionate about, but B, um, Myanmar still does have a long way to go. At the time of creating that uh, handbook, there had been a um, suicide uh, of a, a student at a university here uh, who had um, uh, apparently been bullied for being gay. So that created some kind of momentum, which we wanted, we really wanted to vocalize on. So yeah, so the handbook, how has it been received? Well, I think I'd like to start by saying we had a day where we, uh, for the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, we had a day in uh, May where despite COVID, we encouraged a lot of companies to raise the LGBT flag. And um, that was before, just before the release of the handbook. And um, through a lot of hard work, we ended up having a 50% increase from the year before that. So we had in total, we had 36 um, uh, companies raising the flag um, and just people being more aware of it, right? Which is, I think, so important. It's, it's raising the awareness. So the handbook, uh, so far, it's received about 500 downloads. It's had about 500 downloads. So it could do better. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that people are just going to pick up. So it's up to us to disseminate and to make sure people hear about it. But um, the cause is being pushed forward because thanks to organizations such as Colors Rainbow, whom we did the handbook with, who have their own TV channel and um, it's like, like news channel on Facebook, basically, where they make entertaining videos to educate people. So we do also provide trainings and things. But um, I mean, I don't sound entirely positive because I guess what I really want is for the typical Myanmar CEO to read it. I don't want the multinationals per se. Um, I mean, it's great if they do read it, but they're already on board. The real target has to be those people. And the best way to do that, to be honest with you, is to pick up the phone. And the best way to do that is if they know who I am. And that's why, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, that's why it's so incredibly useful that I have become a kind of public figure here because people actually give me the time of day. So the great thing is I can now promote the causes I'm most passionate about through different ways. Yeah, yeah, this is, I mean, this is great because this is what I, I, I was very keen on um, asking you was you, you appear on many uh, Myanmar channels. If you type in your name in YouTube or Facebook or, or whatever it is, you're going to find so much content about so many different channels and you get ones from the BBC to something which is a bit smaller, um, something maybe a bit more local, but 
from when I was watching them, it seems like the unifying factor in, in all of these um, channels was the um, willingness to, to discuss women empowerment um, and women and equality, essentially. And it's something which I felt was there was a persistence of people wanting to discuss this and a growing insistence on, on, on learning. So do you think that this is something which is um, gonna carry on indefinitely um, in Burma? Or do you think that it's, it's something which, which still needs a bit more momentum? Mm. Yeah, well observed. Uh, I don't think everyone would have seen that. I think you're probably thinking, sp referring specifically to one of the BBC videos where there's a book behind me that says Girl Power. That video was before we started shooting uh, I had a very interesting conversation with the main editor who said, listen, Maya, we want to shift um, the views of the younger generation and we need people like you to help us do it. So we need to have strong uh, uh, young women in the public eye. Um, and we do it by, you know, making it fun and entertaining, but at the same time, trying to inspire them. So that's when I jumped on board. And the fact, I mean, the mere fact that he was saying that means that something's changing. I mean, you could argue that, oh, it's the BBC and therefore, you know, it's a, it's such a, it's a, it's a big, um, it's machine, it's a big machine, right? It's machinery. So not the local channels might not be following suit, but um, I definitely think that trends occur and uh, BBC is starting that trend. And the fact that I was able to talk about uh, LGBT rights in that video uh, without getting any negative feedback. I mean, I did do it very diplomatically, right? I mean, I didn't say, hi guys, I'm queer and um, you better be happy with LGBT plus people. No, but uh, still it was going around the bush and people were very positive about it. The video received about 3 million views, something like that. And it was it was well received. So that was also what, what inspired me and what continues to inspire me to interview people and to talk about subjects that um, uh, people could start perceiving differently. For example, tonight I'm interviewing a, a couple, a, a famous actor who recently got married to talk about married life. And what does Myanmar marriage mean? What is the essence of it? So these conversations are to be had. And, and I think people are willing and interested. There are also, by the way, um, uh, regardless of me, there are some fantastic um, networks, for example, Myanmar uh, Women's Network. Um, and these organizations are doing fantastic things. Recently, there was TEDx Yangon Woman. They brought some incredible Myanmar women to the screen and also international woman, the former uh, uh, Australian prime minister. She gave an amazing speech. Oh, wow. So yeah, there is momentum happening and it's great, <laughs> but work still needs to be done. Yeah. And, um, and, and this idea that you, um, you're trying to curb the stereotypes, especially um, starting from the younger generation, do you think that your um, your music and your and your singing has kind of helped you do that? Uh, to be honest with you, at the end of the day, I'm still a foreign girl who's singing Burmese, and that right now is what they love. Right? I think what the difference will be in the long term is that they will realize that I'm not there to just be the white monkey. I'm really not. I'm here to make change and to keep it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, there have been some foreigners uh, who have been here and, and done a similar thing and become famous. And each, has, each have their own ambitions and goals. Um, but for me, it really is, I mean, at the moment, the, the traction is coming from the fact that I sing and sing in Burmese and people love it because I'm singing the traditional songs and they're like, wow, oh my God. But uh, in the long term, hopefully they'll realize that it's much more than that. You know, I want to bring what you also, I think, um, want. I want to bring real stories to the screen. I want to talk to a farmer and talk about his life and, and bring his story and, and, and share his perspective of, and how difficult it is. And for people to listen because someone is interviewing them who's genuine. And that's my real goal is to come across as someone who is genuine and, and that we're just human, you and I, we're all the same. And that I'm accessible, I'm real, just because I might be this or that, just because I learned Burmese, well, you could go and learn English. And that's something I'm also very passionate about. You could go and learn English and 
the world could be your oyster. Um, because a big barrier here is, is lack of um, English and lack of critical thinking. So, yeah. I, I love this idea that you're, you know, you're saying that there's, at the, at the end of the day, you know, they love, uh, Myanmar people, they love to um, listen to a foreigner speak, speak Burmese and, and sing in their, their own language. But I like how you're also, you know, asserting yourself and saying, you know, yeah, you can have this part of me, but with this part of me comes the, these other things. And I'm, and I, I, I'm going to put them on the table. If you want to take one thing, you have to take everything because this is, you know, this is me. And I think that is um, just a very amazing. Thank you so much. I think it would have, uh, SOAS would not have been drilled into me if I hadn't asserted myself. That's so us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you um, you speak a lot um, on on news channels um, in Burmese. You sing in Burmese. You are living in Yangon at the moment and speaking Burmese. So, uh, how do you find the confidence to you know to get up every day and speak and continually learn something which isn't isn't something which uh, everyone does. The big difference in being a public figure here versus anywhere else, I reckon, is that no matter how many mistakes I make, people are super kind. Most people, most people are super kind. And the comments that I read every day are just so sweet. Like, oh, chipo kaune, you know, I love you more. And, um, you know, you, they say like, dear Maya, you might be a little bit off here and there, but overall, thank you so much for the effort. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope you're well, may you be healthy. So if you're constantly getting that feedback, right? I feel so motivated and happy to be of service. So really it's just um, listening to what people, uh, you know, enjoy and what's making them happy, especially during COVID. It's been a really difficult time. Knowing that if I make a video that it will make them happy, of course I'm going to do it. Um, and then the second thing is I am, I guess I'm naturally quite an extrovert. I love meeting people. I love connecting to people. I, I kind of thrive off that and um, facilitating and, you know, bringing people together. So it's not, um, it's not hard for me. Before COVID, I was doing a lot of live venues, sometimes with, you know, 400 people. And that was lovely. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. So yeah, but then again, if this was somewhere else, I probably wouldn't have dared. And you think, um, I mean, the vocabulary which is which is going going around, it's it's not you know something every uh, everyone would know about certain in, intricate vocabulary which is uh, maybe more specific for the workplace environment, or if you're going to be talking about women empowerment or um, equality. Um, that's, I mean, the vocabulary is something which is quite specific for that. Um, and it's not, it's not the same as, hello, how are you? I would like to order this. I would like to go, go to this place. Give me this much money. It's, it's something more intricate. So how do you um, learn, learn these new words and these new structures? I wish I could tell you that I study every day for an hour, but I really don't. <laughs> Um, what, what the way that, uh, it, that I'm motivated and that I do it is, um, if, first of all, through pressure. If someone says, hey, Maya, we're going to shoot you tomorrow about women empowerment. I'm like, okay, I better get those words ready. Um, <laughs> and then the second way is um, through heart to heart conversations. So my favorite thing to do is just to sit down with someone who might be interested in, uh, might be a feminist, right? A guy who's a feminist and just sit with him and, and, and ask him these questions and get familiar with the sound and the, you know, what, how I could pronounce it and then maybe repeat it, but without making it feel like it's a lesson, um, just over a couple of beers or something. So that, that's really um, powerful. But then, yeah, I think I could do better. <laughs> uh, I probably like, you know, I probably could do with studying a couple of hours every day, but I'm just not that, I'm quite a non-linear person. So for me, it's just, I, I follow religiously um, videos of, of women talking to each other about it being in the workplace. And then obviously my organization, it's, um, it brings in a lot of uh, those kinds of terminologies, like uh, for example, like anti-corruption, it's a really long word, but for me, it's, it's like saying, I'll go to, I'll go downstairs because I hear it so many times. So 
Agri lies am daitye. Oh yeah, of course. So yeah, it's a combination. <laughs> so you're exposing yourself, right? You're exposing yourself to these um, these channels. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I recently watched a BBC interview with you and the Burmese MMA fighter Aung, Aung La Ensang. Um, yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought you, I mean, because it was, it was mostly in, in Burmese, but it was kind of about uh, MMA fighting, um, but, how, uh, but the potential of the sport in um, empowering women. And it's a sport which you also do. Um, so I, I wanted to know, um, you know, what that experience was like. Oh my God, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, amazing human being, Aungla. Um, I approached the BBC with that idea in mind because Aungla has never been interviewed um, about on, around that topic. And I think he was taken a little bit to surprise which was great because we were able to really dig into the question and it felt like a genuine conversation. I loved it because, uh, I mean, it was funny because he said this is the answer he gave like, when I asked him what he would do if his daughter went into MMA fighting. The first thing he said was, I would prefer her to be a doctor or an engineer, but if she does decide, I'll support her. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just great to start that conversation with him and get other people on board to think about it. Even though I think people were way too distracted and just were focusing on his fight, which was coming up two days later. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was, I guess it was so nice, um, especially because, you know, when I clicked on the video, I was like, okay, there's an MMA fighter. Um, okay, they're probably gonna be talking about just MMA or um, maybe some something about Myanmar. But I, I, I really liked how you just kind of you just tackled it head on and you were just, you're not afraid to um, discuss something which, you know, previously hasn't necessarily been uh, smoke, spoken about. It was quite fun, yeah. Cause I mean, we also talked about beekeeping because he, before he started fighting, he was beekeeping, right? And, uh, and he said that he was very passionate about it and he probably would be doing it right now if he hadn't been a success in the MMA world. So yeah, I, I think it really is about breaking people, like um, breaking things down and talking about the core stuff. Yeah. Um, so I have a bit of a, a disjointed question and it's it's not necessarily something which is we've, we've discussed um, throughout this time, but so so I understand that you're, you're part Dutch and part um, Israeli. And Correct. you yeah. have been working to try establish ties between Israel and, and Myanmar at the moment. What is- That's right. What is it in particular, if you can say what you what you what you're doing and um, and how and how that is? Yeah, sure. Um, I first of all let me say that uh, I I don't really have a connection with uh, like living in Israel, but I do have an Israeli passport and a Dutch passport. And the real connection for me is um, with my family. Uh, I have a very interesting family where my my, my Jewish well my the whole family is Jewish, but my grandma is Moroccan. My granddad is Syrian. Um, so, and then my dad has a very interesting life story as well. Uh, he was in the Navy SEAL and then he became a pilot. And so anyway, it, it's very close to my heart, but in a kind of emotional way. And that's, I think, why I, I'm so passionate about bringing the two countries together. But the thing that I like is that making connections can be done in many ways. And I think when people hear Israel, they go, oh. but something that we did recently, which I think, um, uh, uh, supports my thesis is we brought to this, we did an international webinar with the biggest um, disability rights organization in Israel, the leading uh, rights organization, and then brought here, uh, brought to the screen um, some really inspiring speakers uh, on the topic of accessibility and inclusion. Um, we did this in collaboration with the uh, Embassy of Israel, with the Myanmar Israel Chamber of Commerce, and then this organization. And then we invited some very important companies, Myanmar companies, who may not have ever heard anything about this topic before. And the great thing was that they showed up. We had 85 participants with some really inspiring talks. We had a, a singer with someone doing sign language interpretation in Burmese of the Israeli singer. Um, and we had you know, simultaneous interpretation. Uh, we had um, simultaneous captioning. And just bringing together these two worlds 
with a country, Israel, that, is, that has so much experience in, in terms of accessibility and inclusion and Myanmar people being so inspired and the CEOs saying, you know what, I'm gonna try harder. That is amazing. And so I'm excited. I'm excited for the future and especially to forge connections in, in terms of agriculture, um, uh, tech uh, and health. And so, yeah, and so diversity and inclusion comes into all of that. But I think Myanmar can really benefit from those areas. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's, that's such a cool idea as well. Do you think there's going to be something which is which which will carry on, um, you know, next year, or it's going to build upon? Hundred percent. Yeah, we're doing another one uh, in two weeks' time. Oh wow! And, yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, this is just the beginning for us. I have a very great uh, connection with the Israel ambassador who shares my vision. So we are constantly thinking of new things to do. So it definitely sounds like the uh, the future is bright. For yourself yeah. in Myanmar. Mazal tov, yeah, exactly.